Uh, it's been a very interesting week since we started on Monday. Uh, of course, with the cotton razor on inflation uh, in at 11.61%, much bigger than some expected, met a bit of the forecast. Then, of course, we had the household kerosene, diesel, petrol, and uh, other data from the MBS on Tuesday. So it's been very heavy week. And again, we're, we're looking on to the rest of this week. Friday will be the biggest day with the biggest economic data you can have on your table, and that's the third quarter GDP numbers for the Federal Republic of Nigeria. What's the size? Who contributed what? We're going to be a very field the Friday. Then we're going to have all the discussion and all the fights and conversations and brick parts over the weekend. Then when we resume on Monday, uh, we'll be taking a quick look at the Central Bank Monetary Policy, the final meeting for the year. Then Tuesday, we have Godwin Demifili speaking on the communicate of those two days meeting. So it's going to be very heavy all the way till the end of uh, uh, the week and the end of the month. But don't forget, the Bloomberg three-day uh, new economic forum starts today in Beijing. It's one of the biggest gathering after the World Economic Forum in Davos. It's the second biggest uh, put together by Michael Bloomberg, the founder uh, of uh, Bloomberg uh, L uh, LLC. Of course, the big names will be speaking. Uh, two Nigerians, Aliko Dangote and Ngozi Okunjo, who are former economic, uh, finance, former finance minister and coordinator of the economy, are on the advisory uh, council of the Bloomberg New Economic Forum, and they are all there as well as the Channels Media Group uh, executive chairman, Dr. John Mama, who is moderating a panel on China's Belt and Road Initiative. What does this mean for Africa's ramping up on infrastructure? and broad economic development. That will be a major focus. One panel we're reporting uh, to you here on the channel, so don't miss that the rest of the week. But let's just roll back quickly the state of the banking sector. All of this will be part of what the MPC at the Central Bank will be thinking about. So AfriInvest uh, launched is um, the 2019 forward-looking, more like uh, Nigeria banking sector report on Monday. The panelists there sat down to discuss the state of the banking industry and what does it mean for the economy. Let's take a listen to what some of the panelists had to say. I dare say that if we were going to electronic voting, I would venture into politics. <laughs> because, and, and I say this more from the point of view that you, you, uh, people like me can't really compete with, with, the, with the politicians out there. And the reality hits the road on voting day, when on election day. You just realize that you just, you just can't cope with it. But if a lot of people in this room know that they don't have to go and battle it out, they could just pick up their phone and at 12 o'clock you can go and make and vote for the person of your choice. I think we might begin to change uh, governance a bit. So I think that's the first thing about the electronic uh, voting thing. The second thing is, uh, and I think it's happening, to try and concentrate a lot more on what I call a sub-national government. Uh, we tend to think too much about the national, Nigeria, Nigeria, Nigeria. Nigeria is made up of about 36 states and one federal, ter uh, one capital territory. And uh, we have to start evaluating and doing things on a state-by-state -state basis. You know, people have asked me, you know, in my own travels, hey, what about the GDP of Nigeria and this? And I say, which state are you talking about? Unemployment, which state are you talking about? Growth, which state are you talking about? Because it varies. So I think uh, using, concentrating a lot more on this uh, subnational is something that's very important. Uh, what has come up a lot more today has been this, the cost of, uh, cost of governance, especially even our civil service. And I remember about maybe 12, maybe even longer years ago, economic summit. Uh, we had summit and we had the president of Botswana. He came around and he was like the guest, uh, the main speaker. And he said something very interesting that I wondered, and I hope maybe uh, uh, Professor Charles Soludo could help us here. He, he decided that the state, the civil service, that is the government itself, would only spend as much, as, as much revenue as it gets from the economy. Uh, all the income they got from diamonds and gold, for which they, had, they, they do have a lot of that, he said he would devote to education, to uh, infrastructure, and health. But if the government, <coughs> the government wants to pay itself, 
is going to generate it from having an economically viable environment. So that is to say, income you get from taxes and customs and those things, that's all you're going to get to run government. And that way, government cannot be larger than the economy is serving. And I think it'll be interesting if we can sort of take a look at that, because our, our governance structure is way above the economy that we, that we have currently. So I think that's something that uh, would be a nice, bold move. Uh, with the banking sector, mine is more of a, a near emotional plea, just that uh, we wish the banks would just have a much stronger developmental orientation in the kind of decisions they take. Uh, um, if, I want to be, if I want to be naughty, I'll say the banks are very good at uh, spending other people's money, but uh, that would be very unfair of me. But the point is, the banks need to do a lot more from a developmental point of view. We talk about SMEs, about entrepreneurship, and all those things. But you, you know, you and I know we can't do this at 25% interest rates. So all these things really need to be revisited, and I think they, can, they also can reduce uh, their cost structure. I think what the government is doing wrong, or what we're doing wrong, is not really understanding what the digital economy is and what the impact and influence it could bring to our future. So I would think that rather than just thinking about education and IT as a cut and paste situation, we need to really think about it in our context. What does it mean? I remember reading years ago about Singapore and other um, countries at that time that were developing, and they really took a step back and un to understand the end product they wanted to put out. And it was the people. Um, what does a Singaporean look like? What contribution does he or she bring into the economy? How do we now educate that person to be able to fully meet his or her potential? I think in Africa, we just educate just because. You know, go to school. Your mom say, your dad say, go to school. You know, you go, you either become an engineer, doctor, lawyer. You know, you just got to have a, 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 a kind of profession. But why are we doing these things? I think we need to really understand that. I get wary when we put numbers up, talking about education. You know, yeah, the country is only contributing 7%, for example, in Nigeria, compared to South Africa that is doing almost 30% of the GDP. But look at South Africa. I mean, does it really make a difference? in the percentage that you're putting into education if you're educating wrong, if you don't understand why you're educating. So I think for me, that's something that we'll do wrong. And then also in technology, we're adopting the same concept. We are taking technology because everybody says we should do technology. I mean, look at our banks. Yes, they're doing well, but are they really banking? Are they really giving us the solutions that we need? The technology that they're investing in are those technology delivering the kind of services that we as consumers are looking for? And I think the answer is no. In all my years in the corporate world, I've never seen a corporate transformation that's been driven on the back of cynicism. And, and you know it, You're all, we're all running organizations. None of us has achieved any change <laughs> with being so cynical. So it's about rechanneling cynicism into action. Now, what are some of the actions? To my mind, there's some low-hanging fruits that we've all got to get together and, you know, in a sense, push government towards. So I look at the oil sector and I say to myself, Let's look at the joint ventures that we have within the oil sector. So currently we have these unincorporated joint ventures in which government is paying cash calls. We've been talking a lot about it. Let's incorporate the joint ventures so that they're standalone entities that can raise finance on their own. They stop being a drain on government uh, resources. They, they start running a lot more efficiently. The uh, multinational companies get a lot more confident. They put more money into these entities. Hopefully, we produce more oil. And at the end of it all, government gets more tax revenues. I, I think, you know, th this, is my, this is my first contribution. The most critical aspect is the foundation on which Nigeria is sitting is quite weak. Uh, Professor Soludo, in one of his recent presentations, actually made a very, very good point that you're building a skyscraper on the foundation of a bungalow. It's just not going to work. Uh, 
However, if you look at the states, what they are doing wrong, I think the, the point is there's too much emphasis on the national government. So assuming we're not going to get reform, radical reform that the way we want it, um, devolution of power, cutting down civil service, what can we do with what we have today to achieve better results? For instance, being in public service, I thought that one of the critical things to do was to say to the states, your own reform agenda, what is it? I mean, I, if you work in uh, public service right now, we try to reform the tax collection system. We try to you know, set up automation to integrate payroll, pension, those very basic things that I think you don't need a constitutional reform to achieve. It's not happening. Investment in education, you don't need so much to galvanize uh, you know, young people into um, gaining skill sets and different crafts. Um, so the thing that we're doing wrong is obvious. The things that we should do right is still debatable. But most importantly, on a final note, I think that we are not taking advantage of our youths, which is the yeah. you know, large part of the population, and as well as technology. The regulatory framework for technology, I mean, if you want to set up a company, we are in the fintech space. It is too burdensome. I mean, try to get a mobile money license and all that stuff. It is extremely expensive, very burdensome. So you're not going to get the kind of shift, fast-paced growth that you expect, even with the you know, kind of uh, economic foundation or social foundation or political foundation that we have today. Mm -hmm. That's my piece. The entire state spending of all three levels of government in Nigeria is about uh, 14 trillion naira. The economy is 140 trillion naira. You take out the interest payments, it's uh, 12 trillion naira. And by my calculations, that's about 60,000 naira per Nigerian. Now, it's impossible to deliver public education, basic health care, infrastructure, power, security with on 60,000 naira, naira per Nigerian. So the result of that, of course, is Nigerians are very intelligent, and they we've coined the term self-organized. They supply their own power, their own education, their own health care, their own security, their own infrastructure. Um, so, and in fact, just, I'm not sure people are aware of this, 85% of school children in Lagos are educated in private schools. So not only are you all sending your children to private schools, but your driver and your maid is sending to private schools. So I would then say to the federal government, the number one challenge for the federal government is to be relevant to the people, because right now they're not relevant. In fact, they, well, they are relevant. <laughs> But they're relevant in a negative sense. So how many of you would be happy if you got stopped by the Nigerian police, if you had to go see the customs, if you had to go see the FIRS? Uh, and I think that's an enormous, an enormous challenge. I think a second point that's clear for we, you know, we coined the term is poor and poor, and eventually Uwe told me to stop saying that, Andrew, because everyone knows that now. So we know we're getting poorer and poorer. Um, the question is, how do we not get poorer and poorer? Well, mathematically, we need to have investment in the country that's about double the current rate of investment. Uh, so we have a world, we have 20 trillion, uh, naira, 20 trillion dollars, euros in negative interest assets, and people in Nigeria and people abroad are refusing to invest in the country with the greatest economic potential uh, on the planet. Why are they not investing it? And I think that's the second issue the federal government needs to ask itself is, were they, I mean, my wonderful friend Yuanda keeps going out, NIPC, people are not investing uh, in Nigeria. Uh, the panel is discussing the state of the economy and all that includes the banking uh, sector. So let's uh, have those uh, who were debating about Brexit and a lot of that. That was in the UK, as it were. Of course, uh, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn had uh, a bit of a face-off on, on, on TV yesterday. Uh, so let's have a bit of an uh, insight into that. Who says what and if we had any clarity as to where we are regarding the uh, exit of Britain from the European Union. Juliana Olayinka, my colleague from our London studios, is uh, bright and early, as always here on the show. Juliana, good morning. Uh, let's uh, start this conversation from this big story, then we dovetail from Brexit to business. But when we talk about the business of Brexit, uh, who says what yesterday, and are we any clearer or nearer to clarity and decision as far as Brexit is concerned? 
Good morning, Bosun. Uh, well, in short, the answer is no, not really. We're not really any clearer. Trial by television is a newish kind of campaign um, uh, method here in the UK. This is the first time we've had two serious prime ministerial candidates uh, face off each other. And to be honest, in this morning, I would say that the kind of uh, feedback from how viewers uh, viewed the performance is pretty unsatisfactory. Uh, nobody was really excited by anything that was said. The format was a little bit dull. Uh, both candidates didn't really have enough time to answer questions, and there was no time for them to really have a standoff between one another. Jeremy Corbyn failed miserably uh, to convince the public about his Brexit plans. Of course, Labour are campaigning against pushing for a second referendum. He didn't um, uh, provide any clarity on when there is a second referendum, whether the Labour Party uh, would be campaigning for or against a Brexit. Also as well, if there is a hung parliament, a lot of people are suggesting there could be, they would then need the support of the Scottish National Party, the SNP. He also failed to say whether or not um, he would be offering the Scottish people a second referendum on unionism. So that's where he failed. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, uh, did come across a little bit disorganised um, rather than reading off an auto you. He was kind of going through his notes and he looked a little bit scruffy. But a snap poll that was done by YouGov uh, just minutes after the debate did show that uh, Boris Johnson won the debate by 51% to 49%. Of course, being an Eton and an Oxford Union uh, boy, he's uh, pretty good at those debates. So, yes, uh, Boris Johnson um, is winning 1-0. OK. Yeah, that sounds more like football there. 51%, uh, if that in the corporate world, you and I know, 51% gets you the majority shareholding, and you get 49%. If I get 51%, that means I, I'm the uh, superior party. So that means uh, uh, the prime minister uh, wins. So that's just about it. So let's just leave it there. But investors and businessmen uh, are more concerned about the world of business. So let's talk about the earnings. Who is winning when it comes to the third quarter's earnings that are still coming through? Talk to us about Kingfisher. Well, Kingfisher, they're the owner of B&Q. B&Q provide lots of um, supplies and housing um, uh, refurbishment kits for people across the UK and in Europe. And um, they've posted uh, abysmal results in the third quarter. Their new CEO, Thierry, um, uh, uh, Thierry uh, person, has said that um, it's really disappointing. He's only been in the job for six weeks. He came in um, after their last CEO, CEO was given a boot, uh, considering their really trying to uh, push some new proposals and new plans to try and get uh, their money up in a really tight competitive market. Um, they have said that uh, new products haven't really gone down well with uh, the public and also as well the European market at the moment is pretty soft. So they posted uh, losses of 3.6%. Um, it rises in France. France outside of the UK is also their second biggest market. They've got losses of about 6.5%. And internationally, their losses are 5%. Uh, they're on the FTSE 100 and their shares dip by 5% this morning. And uh, Kingfisher have also told shareholders that they shouldn't expect anything better in Q4. So let's wrap Thierry it. Garnier, that's the CEO's name. Yes, yes. Uh, we'll talk about some of that here in Nigeria. But uh, it looks like it's good business with uh, Michels and Butlers uh, because, based on their results. It looks like uh, you Londoners uh, uh, are having some nice time uh, going to the pub, having a nice restaurant. And it looks like despite the Brexit, you folks still have deep pockets to spend when it comes to food, healthy food and all of that. Well, yes, you're right. Mitchells and Butler, they've bucked the trend. It's not been um, a good year for some uh, casual dining restaurants. Several of them have had to close down or are in trouble. But Mitchell and Butler's, they are the umbrella company for very popular pub chains, All Bar One and Harvester. They've posted really good revenues um, year on year. And also as well, they're growing their amount of uh, establishments they have across the UK. They've got about 1,700 restaurants at the moment. And uh, they've shown an increase of 3.9% revenue to 2.2 billion pounds which is a lot of money and also they're up uh, pre 
pre-tax profits by 36%. Now, as I was saying, casual dining has gone down, but it seems as though if people are not eating after work, they'd rather go to a pub. And uh, even though they won't be spending as much money, they're getting a lot more people um, in the door. So Mitchell and Butler, they're on the 250 uh, FTSE. They are the biggest riser. So as soon as those announcements came in this morning, uh, Boson, they were up by about 7%. Yeah. I'm going to mark that down uh, for my visit. Thank you so much. Uh, take me there, Juliana Olayinka. For th thank you for taking okay. us there uh, on the show. Thank you, Juliana, from our London Studios, our business correspondent. Take a break. Uh, Access Bank will have a new chairman from January 2020. Uh, who is he or she? Uh, that's after the break.